Hello, this is Paul DeWitt, member of the Nashville Bar Association Historical Committee, and uh, I have the privilege today of interviewing Mr. Bob Warner of the Nashville Bar, a longtime member of our Bar Association, now in retirement. Uh, as part of the oral history project that the Historical Committee of the Bar Association is doing, uh, I'll be interviewing Mr. Warner today about his life and his career as an attorney, focusing on his, uh, his clients, his cases, his reminiscences, people he's gotten to know over the years, and so forth. So, Mr. Warner, uh, why don't I start off by simply asking you your date of birth and place of birth? Well, I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, October 2nd, 1926. And did you grow up in the Nashville community? I lived within four miles of where my house home is now my whole life, except when I was in the service or away at school. Tell us about your education. Well, I went, I went to grade school, a public school in Nashville, and then went to MBA, a high school. And then I went to the University of the South graduated in 1948 and uh, went to Vanderbilt Law School for one year and then went to Yale Law School, which I, from which I graduated in uh, 1951. Uh, I believe your education was interrupted by World War II and tell us a little bit about your service in, in that war and also after the war. I believe you had an opportunity to observe a uh, famous historical event in Japan? Uh, well, I went to the University of the South after my third year of high school, and I had one year before I went into the service. And then I went into the service at that time and was in the infantry. Uh, the day I was 18 years old, I was down at Fort McClellan, Alabama, and went through basic training. That was just about the time of the Battle of the Bulge. And for some reason, I was singled out, <laughs> and didn't go overseas. I went to language school and studied Japanese language at the University of Pennsylvania for about nine months. And then they sent our group, our class, it was a small class, down to Fort Hollabird to, counter, to be in the counterintelligence corps. So I was an agent in the counterintelligence corps and sent to Japan, to Nagoya, Japan, in early, very early uh, 46. Wow. And you had been trained in Japanese. and I could get around a little bit. Get around. I sure can't now. <laughs> wow. So, so I, I suppose uh, at the time, originally, you were being trained. The, the concern was we're going to have to invade Japan. And, uh, of course, uh, the atomic bomb explosions yeah. made it unnecessary to That occurred to while I was it. up at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. But nevertheless, you tr were sent to Japan, and while there, I believe, you were permitted to observe and visit the uh, International War Crimes Tribunal. Well, I, I, was in, I went up to town. I was an agent, as, as I said, in the counterintelligence corps stationed in, I was down in Nagoya. And I had some business up in, in Tokyo, and I went up, up there and, and stayed with, uh, actually, were quite a few people from Tennessee there that were in the international prosecution section. And uh, one of them was Judge Albert Williams. And he was involved in the, with the international prosecution section in the war crimes trial in Tokyo. And uh, he was, his job, as I recall, was to sift, to, to, to weigh ev evidentiary matters and to pass on them uh, for, the, for the trial attorneys. Uh -huh. And actually, it was through him that I became interested in practicing law. Huh. And later, I was a summer clerk while I was in law school at his, at his office, Williams uh -huh. Cummins and West, here in Nashville. Is that right? So, so you actually observed the trials of some of the Japanese who were... I just went there for a couple of days. A couple of days, but uh, that, that must have been fascinating to observe an actual trial 
Of course, most people, when they think of the war crimes, think of the trials against the Nazis at Nuremberg, but also there were uh, the trials against the Japanese criminals in uh, correct in Tokyo. I suppose. Right. Okay, and and uh, that that experience. I guess was one of the things that motivated you to go to to law school and then become a lawyer. Well, it was one thing. Yes. Uh, did you have any family uh, that had been lawyers or judges or? No. Just. Um, and so you, I suppose, applied for and enrolled at Vanderbilt Law School in the fall of '48. Yes. All right. Before we go into that a little bit, I believe you had a terrific experience working in the senatorial campaign of, of Estes Kefauver in 1948. Yes, that was a great experience. Uh, I'd finished the University of the South of Swanee and was going to law school the next fall. So in the summer of, of 48, I had a good friend, Mr. Coleman Harwell. I wanted to ask him if I could work on his newspaper. And he said they didn't have any room down there for somebody. So he was the editor of the Tennessean? Yes, he was a wonderful editor. He probably had the best staff of writers of any paper around here I've had, and maybe in the whole country. Yes. But in any event, uh, he suggested I might get involved in the Kefauver campaign. And I did, and they had a small office here in Nashville that was a headquarters. They didn't have any money, they, a whole lot different than it is now. And they had, oh, about six people working there. I was uh, licking stamps and closing letters and mailing letters for them and all that sort of thing. And Keith Alpha and his wife would travel all over the state and usually make four or five or six stops a day and always usually a radio broadcast if possible at, at night. And they had two automobiles. And there was a fellow named Ch uh, Charlie Neese, was the, later became Judge Neese, was a campaign manager. And there was a fellow who later became, I can't remember his name, but he later became a... Uh, court officer down in the federal court in Chattanooga. Uh, and uh, anyhow, Charlie had to leave the office to go up and try to raise some money for the campaign, and they brought this driver up, and so then they needed a driver. So I became Estes's chauffeur. And uh, they had two cars, and we'd drive around playing music when we got to a little town, and... and uh, the two cars would travel together. No, oh, they would one, split up. They, they, they would uh, hip hop. One, one would go into the town and play the music, <laughs> and uh, the other one would. Uh, and, and 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 the other one had been in another town. They came up and dropped uh, the key offers off, and he'd go around shaking hands. <laughs> but then that car, that car would go on up to the next town and try to <laughs> drum up a crowd. So you would drive. You would drive one of the. Do you remember what kind of car it was, or was it? A, it was either a Dodge. Or, these were both the, the family cars that the uh -huh. chief office had. He was a he was a congressman at the time, uh -huh. and had been a very fine lawyer in Chattanooga. And, and you would drive, I guess, him, his wife, and his daughter. And, no, no. Oh, and just, they just just there was usually a a newspaper reporter with us. I see. Uh, from the, from the Nashville Tennessean. The Tennessean was a big backer of oh, yes. Keith Alver against the, I guess at that time, the Crump, Boss Crump out of Memphis was the main player behind the scenes in Tennessee politics. And he he was running a candidate, or I guess he had fallen out with one of the other opponents of Keith Alver and was supporting a third candidate. And That's Keith Alver was able to, to get in there with a plurality of the vote and get elected yeah. senator. But I drove Keith Alpha and his wife in just about every county of the state. And it's a good example of how things were funded in those days. I carried the money around with me, maybe <laughs> as much as 50 or $100 to oh pay for a hotel or motel <laughs> and to buy meals. I had to do all that. And they'd 
as, as they raised some money, they'd give me a little bit to pay for it. And my pocket was picked up near Knoxville one oh. time. I came in. I didn't know where the senator was going to stay because we, <laughs> we lost our... Well, lost the... And the other funny thing about that, he was called back to Washington to vote one time during the campaign. We were in Knoxville, but was scheduled to go up to some of the northern counties in Tennessee near Knoxville. And so he went on up to Washington to vote, and Nancy, his wife, uh, and I went up to take his place. She was taking his place and making little talks and shaking hands. And I drove on up and didn't really pay attention to the road, and we went to this town and played music, and got, she got out and was shaking hands, and somebody came up to me and said, you're in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, that was, that was a lot oh. of fun and, and a real interesting experience. <laughs> And I believe he traveled, part of his entourage was his raccoon. He, uh, well, it, it he, wasn't his. All right. uh, Crump had uh, said that Kefauve, in some newspaper announcement, said that he was a pet coon of the socialist or something. And, and uh, Estes said, I might be a pet coon, but I'm not Mr. Crump's pet coon. <laughs> and that uh, aroused a lot of interest in uh, People were sending him coonskin caps, which became his symbol. Even when he was running for president and vice president, he always had those coonskin uh -huh. caps. But they actually sent, somebody actually sent him a pet live coon in a cage. And, <laughs> and they gave me the job of taking care of the <laughs> Your job <laughs> was to coon. drive the, the candidate and to care for the coon in his cage. Well, that only lasted for about a week, but uh, we had some experiences with that. Uh, well, that must have been a terrific memory for you. And uh, I, I guess he won the Democratic primary. And since in those days, the Republican Party was not strong at all in That's Tennessee right. or anywhere in the South, the general election was pretty much a foregone conclusion. But by that time, I guess you had started law school. Yes, I had one year. And interestingly enough, Estes Kefauve had gone to Yale Law School. Oh. And on his advice and, and my own desire, uh, he helped get me into law, Yale Law School as a transfer student my, for my second year and third year. Your first year was at Vanderbilt. Correct. But after one year at Vanderbilt, you transferred to Yale. Yeah. Is that right? And so, uh, and graduated from Yale, I guess, in the spring of 51. Correct and then upon graduation came back to Tennessee, to Nashville, and uh, to take the bar and met your partners. One of whom was your father, Ward DeWitt, and the other was Chancellor Henry Denmark Bell. <laughs> well, he later became uh, Chancellor. And uh, we had a firm called DeWitt, Warner, and Bell. <laughs> So, so you passed the bar and I guess got the results back maybe in August or September of 51. Yep. And, and uh, without any clients really or any experience, y'all were able to kind of form a, a nice little operation. Tell us a little bit about the day-to-day -day practice y'all had. Well, obviously we didn't have any clients to start with. <laughs> and, uh, all the people, other lawyers would refer things when they had conflicts. And uh, we had a little work going on, but we'd always have somebody go over to General Sessions Court in the afternoons to the criminal uh, sessions. They had it every afternoon and every Saturday morning. But uh, and you we'd would... go over there and we'd be appointed. They didn't have any, any uh, public defenders in those days, of course. And they, the judges would appoint people for indigent defendant, mostly jail people. Uh -huh. And the jail at that time was in the same build. It was in the one courthouse. Floor above, one floor above. The, what we now call the historic courthouse served not only as the, the location of the courtrooms, but the jail, I guess the district attorney's office was in there, the oh, mayor's yeah. office. As yeah. it is. So you would take appointments uh, because there were a need for someone to represent the indigent. Yeah, and you'd go out and see if they had any money. If you had any money, they'd, you'd try to get them to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you represent a lot of people charged with public drunkenness? Oh, and, yes. And have to greet them in their still intoxicated yeah. state there? Yeah. And, um, well, that must have been quite an introduction to the practice of law. And, and, uh, 
Where were your offices? In the Stallman building. It, it was uh, then at least home to a lot of Nashville's attorneys. That's correct. Uh, and just a stone's throw from the courthouse. And how big a space did the three lawyers, you three lawyers, well, we, have there? We found one large room and had Brico blocks in it converted <laughs> into three rooms. So we had three small rooms. <laughs> no secretary or. We secretary. had a volunteer secretary. Oh, you did? Her name was Keeble. She is there deceased. Right. And I guess if one of you had a client and had to meet with a client, uh, the. The other two of you would have to disappear or go somewhere. Well, for, sometimes that, that, that happened. Uh, I believe one client you had in those early days was a man from Fort Campbell charged with DUI. Yes. Tell I us was, about that. His name was Pillavon, and he was a sergeant, and he was arrested for drunk driving, but he was in jail. He hadn't made bond. And I went back and, and talked with him, and... Uh, uh, in any event, he, he uh, paid me $50, and I tried, we tried the case, and he was acquitted. And uh, anyhow, I went back to the office with the $50, and it was on a Friday afternoon. It was in the fall, and Vanderbilt was playing Tennessee up in Knoxville. This is in the fall of 51. And uh, we wanted to go to the football game. I came back to the office, and we had $50, which... The three of us drove up to Knoxville, and with that $50, we bought tickets to the game, bought, a, uh, bought some whiskey, and ate. We stayed in some fraternity house up there and, and had gasoline that paid for the gasoline coming back. And that just shows you how <laughs> times have changed. So you, you and Denny Bell and Ward DeWitt were able to travel to Knoxville, spend the night, have a good time, buy tickets, watch the football game, and drive back to Nashville and still have change left over. Few, yeah, that's right. From your fee from <laughs> representing... Uh, Sergeant Pivalon. Sergeant Pivalon. Uh, well, those must have been quite the days. Any other interesting experiences while you worked with uh, Denny and Ward in those days? Or? Well, one funny story. There was a lawyer down the hall from us uh, who had... He later became a very fine lawyer, a very big-time lawyer up in Washington with the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, his name was Hugh Helm. And Hugh Helm represented someone who, who had started a barber's college trying to get on the GI Bill of Rights, get people from the GI Bill of Rights. And the government investigated it and said it was fr a fraud, and they indicted his client. And I never will forget, Helm came by our office one day and uh, sat down and was telling us some stories. And a telephone call was transferred and said that the, that the magistrate uh, wanted, the U.S. magistrate wanted to talk to him. And uh, he said, oh, yes, they must have indicted my client. And <laughs> he picked up the phone. And he, they said, yes, we did indict your client, but you've been indicted too. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, they dropped the case oh. against him, but it had to do with some complicity he might have had with his client. Oh, my gosh. But he, he was quite so, a character. So, so y'all were a witness to, to <laughs> Mr. Hill finding out some bad news, at least. He uh, sort of dropped his jaw. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess, uh, I guess after a few years, um, that firm had to separate, break up. I guess Mr. DeWitt, my dad, went with Charlie Trevue and his firm, which was would have been, I think, in the spring of 1955. And uh, you and you and Denny Bell continued for a while, but you uh, were able to obtain a position, a part-time position at least, in the district attorney's office. Is that not correct? Yes, under General Loser. Carlton Loser was Carlton the DA. Loser. And all of the associates or assistant district attorneys want them. They could practice law on the side. Uh -huh. It's hard to imagine now, but actually you had just a few assistant DA. How many were there? Three I think four? when I came there, there were four assistants. Four assistants, and you all handled all the misdemeanor cases as well as felony cases. Yes. Split them up. And I was assigned to the General Sessions Court when I started uh -huh. off, and also I started the... Uh, 
uh, it was a new act, and I drew up all the papers and got it started in, in, in Nashville on the Reciprocal Support Act for children. Ch child support. Child support. And um, so you were able to you were able to prosecute cases, I guess, virtually every day. Correct. And uh, and uh, and as well as create some legislation for child support. Well, not legislation. It's just drawing up papers. Drawing up the papers. They, they had the legislation, right. but we were trying to carry it out. Uh -huh. Yeah, we we met. We had criminal court at, I believe, as it was one one o'clock every afternoon, and you never knew how many cases were on there, and sometimes, particularly on Friday, on Fridays they would, it would sometimes last till eleven or twelve at night. Uh -huh. And it, was it not? Common for an assistant DA to be handed a file, maybe by someone in his office, the office, and be expected to try the case just a few minutes later. In general sessions court, there wasn't uh, any file. There wasn't. There still <laughs> isn't. There's just a they, warrant. They, but, they, uh, they, yeah, that's all they had. So uh, you just go in, and you didn't know what was on the docket. You just have to uh, see. And sometimes, if you have to try, and of course, obviously, a lot of the cases went off on guilty pleas or were null prost. Uh, when you saw that there wasn't anything to them. But uh, you would have time, to, when you actually had a trial, you'd have a few minutes uh -huh. to talk to the witnesses. Uh -huh. but, uh, that, but we didn't have, uh, we didn't have all that. When I went, later went to the criminal court for about three years, we didn't have any files there to speak of before the day of the trial. In other words, they usually would have seven or eight cases on the docket, uh -huh. and you never knew... Uh, which one was going uh -huh. to have to go to trial and which one would be settled. Uh -huh. Now, that's, uh, sometimes there were major cases uh -huh. that you had to work on. Uh -huh. Well, uh, someone who was also there at the time, Doug Fisher, told me there was a lady, I think Pauline Bateman. Yeah, that's right. And she did a tremendous job behind she the did. scenes in the office, getting your files ready, getting your witnesses to court, that's and telling true. you what. Now, that was down in criminal court, not in general criminal sessions. court. Yes, she'd do that, and she was very, very good. Her name was, uh, uh, her name was Pauline Webby. Pauline Webby. Yeah. And uh, so I, I guess in 55, you started under Carlton Loser, uh, and then he was appointed congressman a Correct. little later to uh, take the place of Congressman Percy Priest. Correct. And that created an opening as for district attorney, and I guess... Um, Harry Nichol was appointed district attorney in 56. Correct. And uh, he, he was district attorney for about 10 years, and you worked for several years under him, first in general sessions court and then in criminal court. Correct. Um, in criminal court, I guess then there were two judges, Judges Hart and Gilbert, uh, at, at least when you started, and That's right. were you assigned to one of their courts for a while? I was assigned to Judge Hart's court, and then when he retired, uh, Raymond Leathers, I believe, was appointed, and I judge worked Leathers. Judge with Raymond. I worked not. It was a judge that was not. Not it was Raymond out. His brother, I know, was with the, with the Supreme Court. Ramsey uh, Leathers. Ra it was Ramsey. His, right. This name was. Anyhow. I worked with Judge Judge Lothers in his court for, I guess, three years or four years. Do you have any idea how many cases you tried or how, how many in a typical year you might have tried? I have no days? idea. But suffice to say, you, you were constantly trying cases and... Yes. Uh, there, weren't a lot of, there weren't a lot of discovery in those days. I guess uh, a lot of times you were finding out about the case at the same time the witnesses were testifying. Correct. Yeah. Who were some of the more prominent criminal defense attorneys around in those days? Well, of course, uh, in major matters, uh, Mr. John Hooker and Mr. Jack Norman were probably the leading ones, mm -hmm. although there were a whole lot of other good ones. I remember one was Carl Harden and and, and Frank Taylor did a lot of work. Uh -huh. And then there were younger ones like Bill Wilson and coming along and, and uh, uh, Joe Binkley. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just to name a few. Did you feel like that was a good experience for a young lawyer to have? 
Oh, yes. yes. Getting in there and trying cases against those attorneys. and uh, I believe one of your cases, interesting case, was um, the investigation of and prosecution of some men involved in absentee ballot fraud in the uh, congressional campaign, Carlton Loser and Richard Fulton had. That's correct. Talk about your role in that. You were not simply the prosecutor, but you were also the investigator of that, were you not? Yes. Uh, after the election, which was very close, I think it sh in the original election it showed that Loser had won by less than 20 votes in the county. And uh, the newspapers came out, or actually the Tennessean, uh, claiming there was fraud. And in, 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 uh, they uncovered all this, of, I don't know how, out in the Second Ward. Second, second Ward. Uh, it was at Howard School that they were, were focusing on. It was people who, who they brought these absentee ballot applications to. And, They'd fill them out, and the pe person would sign them, and they were all upset about that. And uh, there had never been any. Well, for example, in, in the not that precinct, but the precinct that I really focused on was uh, was a, uh, I believe it was a laundry on on Eighth Avenue, and, and uh, they had over 65 absentee ballots, and there never had been more than one in in the history of all of the elections. <laughs> In Tennessee, and all these ballots were for Loser or M yeah. Many well, of them. actually, it turned out that the people that were pushing all this were pushing for Frank Clement, who was running for governor at that time. But Loser was the beneficiary of that because on all these that they filled out, they just marked Loser's name too. And, oh, uh, so the ballots really were to get Clement votes, but, yes, but down the ballot, Loser's name appeared, so right. he benefited from the, from the spill-off. So there. anyhow, uh, <laughs> I was, they wanted to investigate it, and this was right interesting enough that because Loser, of course, had been uh, my boss in the district attorney's office. Well, I was assigned the job of looking into it by General Nickel, and like in most cases, most... Uh, criminal cases that are successful, you have to find a snitch. <laughs> right. And <laughs> it's no I, different now. And I found one. And uh, he was a city employee. And Gene Jacobs, who was known as Little Evil, uh, had gotten him a job with the city. He had been a, a ward. Uh, he had been, he'd been a committee person, county com Democrat. Gene Jacobs. Gene Jacobs, known as Little Evil. Right. And so... This fellow told how it happened, and in these cases, this man would take these ballots out and have people sign the applications, and then he would go get the ballots, and Jacobs would actually sign, or somebody would, Jacobs would forge, or the snitch would forge the name of the voter. Of course, that was far more serious than simply uh, uh, arranging for people to get absentee ballots. And I think we found about five or six forged ballots. Actually, some of them were people that didn't even uh, uh, live anymore or uh, uh, had moved out of the uh, out of the district. And uh, so this was rather so complicated. And uh, Nicole asked me to take these witnesses before the grand jury. Of course, not during the grand jury deliberations. But that was a very fine grand jury, as I recall. I, uh, Did you actually find the people whose signatures were forged and have them testify? Some, yes, yes. That they did so, not have in, in any some, knowledge? In some cases, it really wasn't all that necessary because all of them, were, obviously, they were in the same hand, right? right. Oh. The ballots were. Uh, e either well, either Jacobs himself or, or, the, or his One of, man. Well, who, actually, it was several people working with Jacobs on that. I can't uh -huh. remember their names. But there were five others in addition mm -hmm. to Jacobs, and they were all indicted. Uh -huh. And then they asked me to try the case. It lasted several days, and uh, there were quite a few lawyers. That this was one me. big joint trial with yeah, five oh, yeah. or six co-defendants. Yes, and uh, uh, I remember Bill Wilson represented uh, Jacobs, I believe, 
uh, Mr. Jack Norman represented one of the people. I forget who all the others were. But in any event, the, the jury uh, convicted all of them, and Jacobs wow. was given a year in the penitentiary. That must have been a tremendous accomplishment for you to well, bring that. Well, I don't know how tremendous it was. Well, it was, I mean, to, it was interesting work, and I was uh, pleased to see that the way it came out. Uh, Even Jacobs came up to me after he got out of the penitentiary and said, "General, you just done your duty." <laughs> <laughs> well, you did, and more than that, to not only prosecute it successfully, but to have been in kind of on the ground floor investigating it. Um, well, any other, I believe another case, maybe not nearly as highly publicized, although it might have gotten some, was back in the, in the 50s, the uh, legislature passed a private act requiring all parents of school-aged children to have their children vaccinated for polio, and if they didn't, it was a criminal offense. And I believe, uh, there was a man maybe out in Madison, Mr. Maddox, who for, for philosophical or religious re reasons refused to have his children vaccinated. And the DA, I guess Harry Nichol, brought charges against him and you prosecuted him successfully for that. Do you well, remember the one, that? The one that really was <laughs> prosecuting, it was Dr. Lentz, who was a, the county uh, uh, health officer at the time. And he was Ned Lentz's father, I might add. I see. Uh, who, Ned Lentz was a chancellor uh -huh. later. But, uh, John Lentz is who you're referring to. Yes, His, Dr. John Lentz. Uh -huh. And uh, the Lentz Health Center's name for him. Right. But he was the one really pushing that. He'd pushed through the legislation, and he wanted everybody to, to be inoculated. And uh, anyhow, the, the, the man was convicted. Uh -huh. And... Uh, I don't know what he's fined or what happened to him. He might I think have... he got a $50 fine. And, yeah, that's and, right. Uh, well, it's hard to imagine a, a county health department director now having that much political clout to where he could get a private act passed by the legislature and get the district attorney to prosecute somebody criminally. Uh, I don't know whether he got the... Le I'm not, I don't, I'm not he, familiar whether he got the legislation uh, through, but he was all in favor of it. Uh -huh, I know that. Uh -huh. uh, any other interesting criminal prosecutions you had or? Well, there were a lot of them that were interesting, but yeah. I don't want to go on. All right. All right. Anyway, at the same time you were in the DA's office, you also were practicing law in, in private practice, were you not? Yes. T talk about how that came about. Um, well, I just, uh, uh, I just, I just, had an office in several with several of the law firms. I was at the I had an office in the Waller firm, and later later with with another one another firm, and finally in 1960 I believe it was, I went with uh, Bill Dibbon and well it was was Mr. Norville's firm Norville and Minnick, but Norville had died and Mr. Minnick left to go over to the Tribune office, and so it left Bill Dibbon and and uh, Dewey's Berry there, and we, anyhow, we formed a partnership. I was still in the district attorney's office for a short time after that. Uh -huh. In fact, that, that election fraud case was the last case I had, and that was in 1961. Uh -huh. And from that time on, I was with uh, uh, Dearborn Dib and, Dib Dib and uh, Berry and Warner. Uh -huh. Where were their offices? What building do you remember? Well, we were in the Commerce Union Bank for a little while, but the bank took those offices over because, for one reason or another, and we, uh, we were placed in sort of a, an adjacent building. It used to be the, I think it was the downtown law school. It was in the building next to, they called it the Chamber of Commerce building, I believe. Uh. I might be wrong on that. But it's long since been destroyed. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But we were there, and then later we moved back to the Commerce uh -huh. Union Bank building. And and you were practicing with, I guess, Mr. Dearburn and Deweese Berry, and well, later uh, uh, Cletus McWilliams from Cletus Franklin McWilliam. joined us. Uh -huh. And then later uh, in 1971, uh, Lamar Alexander joined us. Uh -huh. And uh, that's what one interesting thing in in our career was. Lamar Alexander was uh, a partner of ours, and John Edwards was an associate of our firm in the 80s. 
And I bet you there's no other law firm in the United States that had two people that ran for the presidency. <laughs> I'm sure there's not. If, uh, and, and you actually mentor both of them a little bit. Well, I didn't first... have to mentor Lamar because he was interested more in politics, <laughs> and I couldn't mentor him in that. <laughs> but John, John did work for me. Uh, John Edwards. Did work yeah. for me. He, was, he had clerked for a federal judge in, in I don't know, it was North Carolina, Virginia. And he and his wife came over here to practice law. Uh -huh. And he was with us for about two or three years, and they uh -huh. went back to North Carolina. Uh -huh. Did you and he work on the, I believe, the Waverly train derailment litigation? Yes, yes. He was, he was my helper in that. We represented one of the defendants. That, that referring to the, uh, to the, to the lawsuits that emerged from the uh, train derailment at Waverly, Tennessee, and, and subsequent explosion, explosion in the cleanup effort that right. caused a lot of, a lot of injuries. We represented one of the defendants. I see. The, uh, but anyway, back in the, back when you uh, left the DA's office back in 61 or 2 and you started full time, I guess, with Dearborn and, and Barry and um, over the years your practice grew and grew. What, who were some of your clients and what type of legal work were you doing during those years? Well, as far as I was concerned, uh, most of the work was, I did was a variety of types of Worked for Commerce Union Bank, and including loans, uh, bond uh, issuance of bonds, uh, representing the trust department, and uh, handling litigation. And uh, the actually, practice actually, of law was less specialized then. It sure was, as far as <laughs> I was concerned. I had, you did all kind of things. <laughs> Well, I did. I've done labor, been involved in labor law. I'm admitted to the uh, tax court of the United States and, uh, of course, the Supreme Court. But, uh, and that's just an example of it, it wasn't that specialized. That's, right. that's the whole point. Uh, and, uh, and as you mentioned a while ago, you, you, the Dearborn and Firm expanded over the years and took in a lot of very good attorneys. And you've already mentioned Lamar, although he may have been more interested in politics. But who were some of the other attorneys that came with the firm over the years or well, that did. came with you as a result of any mergers that y'all had with other firms? Well, we merged with, with the, what had formerly been the Bailey Firm. Mr. Bailey died some time ago before that. But it was Andrew Ewing's firm and Lou Connor and, and, and Bob Eccles, who later, of course, was a federal district judge. And uh, they were, we merged with their firm and they all became partners. And from that time on, it, the firm was called Dibbitt and Ewing. And that's when it really started to grow. Uh, we st when we started under that name, the time it was organized, I guess there were about 12 lawyers. and I, If I'm not mistaken, we had somewhere between 70 or 80 lawyers by the mid-80s. Wow. It was one of the larger firms in the state. And uh, With offices and it, in the Commerce Union Bank building? Or? Yes, and then and, and after 78, we had th three floors in the new Commerce Union Bank building. Yes. Of where the Doubletree Hotel is. Yes. And the... We might have started with two floors, then later got a third. Um, and um, I believe Commerce Union was merged in with Sovereign Bank. And, Correct. And uh, you, stay, you continued to represent the successors to Commerce Union yes. over the years. And uh, I believe it, you even were involved in creating a new bank in Chattanooga. And yes, they, they, that was after the Bank Holding Company Act was passed in by the legislature in Tennessee, and uh, I helped him start a new bank. I did the legal work in getting, getting that bank established. Uh, which I do. Well, you, you've not only worked in corporate and banking law, but you've also, obviously, as you already mentioned, criminal law as a prosecutor. And Well, in defense uh, work, most of the defense work in criminal law has been antitrust. I was involved in all the bid rigging oh. paving case. I remember oh. <laughs> I never will forget my man, 
again, that's an example of finding a snitch. Then you'd, they'd get one of them convicted and then promise to get him a light sentence if he would implicate others. Right. And they finally implicated my client. I won't mention his name. And uh, he had no choice but to plead guilty. And we uh, went for the federal judge uh, for sentencing. And uh, I was asking for leniency because I said this man didn't own the company. And I, I'd had an airplane take pictures of all these other uh, asphalt people. They had huge houses where they owned them. And a picture of my man's house, which was just a very small little bungalow. And I uh, said, now look, my man was a very small actor in this. And the U.S. attorney who was in there at the time said, yes, he was a small actor, but he, he was involved in rigging over $800 million in 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 uh, contracts over a period of five years. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but maybe he didn't get much of the cut out well, of that. Well, really. that was interesting, though, because uh, the, the, the judge sentenced him to a year. And I forget which judge this was, but he was a relatively new judge and, uh, in the federal court. And uh, he sentenced him to a year. And under the old, old law, my man would have been eligible for parole or, or at least after serving four months or a third of his sentence. But they changed that law where you had certain... Uh, uh, Release depend, eligibility. Eligibility based on the seriousness of the crime. And so he was caught where he had to serve at least a year. Oh. Uh, and uh, I raised that point in a motion, and uh, the judge said, I didn't know they'd change that law. So he cut his son down to four oh. months. Well, you got him out of uh, prison a lot sooner <laughs> than he might have otherwise. Yeah. So, uh, Also, I believe you worked on some civic commissions in the, in the 60s. Tell us a little bit about your experience there. Well, in the early 60s, uh, you'd had the sit-in movement uh, here in Nashville, and uh, the Mayor Briley was trying to get things settled on that. This is before we had any any uh, legislation creating or ordinance creating a uh, human relations commission. Anyhow, he formed what was called the Mayor's Committee on human relations, and Mr. Jim Bass, who, by the way, is, oh, still goes to his office and he's over 100 years old. Bass, Barry, and Sam. Yes. Uh, he had been chairman of it for about a year or six, six months, and they'd been very successful. The bankers, there were three bankers on it, one from the First American, one from the Third, and, and Commerce Union, and there were a couple of other people. Went, uh, Oh my goodness, Greenfield Pitts from Harvest was one of the most active members of it. And after Mr. Bass uh, uh, resigned uh, from that position, they named me as chairman. And, uh, and this was Mayor Briley's Committee on Human Relations? Yeah, uh -huh. and we were successful in, in uh, were you getting several, getting several of the, working out with the, getting several of the restaurants uh, to agree to, to uh, allow blacks to eat there. Uh -huh. well, I guess the, the concern was a lot of restaurants were not permitting blacks to, to eat there or had under a segregation policy, right. and you were trying to bring pressure on the business owners to desegregate and well, were able I, to I, do I, that. I would say we were trying to mediate it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to say bring pressure. Mediate. But sometimes, sometimes okay. it wound up mean pressure, but I won't yeah. go into that. Uh, and then I, I believe later on you were on the Human Relations Commission. Yes, a, the, a more formal uh, body was set up. I don't know if it was ever as successful as the <laughs> Mayor's Committee was, but I remember Jim Neal and I were lawyers appointed on, the, on that initial uh, uh, commission. <laughs> of course, it still exists today. <laughs> Did, uh, tell us, I believe you met with Mayor Briley once or twice and he asked for your advice about how to handle these situations. What was it like 
dealing with him? Oh, he was very helpful. And uh, he, what he wanted was to get things to quiet down right. and, and get these restaurants right. open and, and, involve, and, and get out to avoid any violence. Right. Well, apparently y'all were fairly successful because uh, Nashville was not, did not become known as a place where riots occurred or uh, uh, like some of the other southern cities. So Nashville is sometimes held up as a model of southern cities in that area of town. Well, of course, in the 60s, uh, President Johnson got the Civil Rights Act passed and that uh, gave, e that, gave right. uh, that, that, that covered uh, gave the force public, of law to public facilities. Uh -huh. um, all right well are there any other uh, are there any other activities both as a lawyer or just as a citizen in our community that you've been involved in? Oh I was involved in several political campaigns. Any one in particular that you have interesting story or two about, or well, uh, <laughs> I, I was very much involved in in, in, in Nashville as, as in the county. I, mean, I was co-chairman in, in Davidson County with I believe it was Allen High uh, of, of Mr. Edmund Orgel's campaign for governor. Oh, and he was from Mayor of Memphis, and I known him because he was a, he was the brother of my uncle's wife, and uh, I'd worked with him in the Kefauver campaign in '48. He was one of he and Lucius Birch were the leading Memphis people to break up the Crump machine. That's how, and then later Mr. Algo got elected mayor. But in any event, he was running, and it was a very close race. Do you remember what year this was? That was in 19. 58, uh -huh. and in 58, I, actually I was still in the district attorney's office, yeah. and it uh, it didn't go over too well with the people in power in the state because uh, Ellington was running, he was close to the governor, and they, they were the ones that, they were close to Losa too, but in any event, uh, um, in this county, uh, I was helping manage that campaign, and I never will forget on election day, uh, uh, I got a call from these people, the League of Women uh, voters. type voters. It was a group that was supporting Ogle. He was the, the liberal or progressive <laughs> candidate in those days. Just before we go any further, the man you're referring to is Orgel, O-R-G-I-L-L. -L, Correct. Is probably not well known nowadays, but he was. Well, his name is because they have the Orgel Brothers. In Memphis, Brothers, he may be. Orgel Brothers uh, uh, Company, which covers the whole South. He had been head of that okay. before he was mayor. And uh, but in, in any event, uh, I got this call. I was driving around the county, different boxes, to see how the voting was going, and I got. I called in and somebody had me call back to this this lady said they're stealing the election out at uh, on the and this is that that same this is that same same ward where box where where Jean Jacobs stuff was they're stealing the election out there you better go check up on it is this on Eighth Avenue yeah, South yes and I went out there and there was a window in front of the building and there was a policeman sort of half lying down and half sitting down up against the window, and then there was this man who I recognized as one of the clerk, or, oh, well, he was a uh, sort of, a, he wasn't a clerk, but he was a helper in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, court, up in the court, in, in, in the court. Court officer or whatever. Well, he wasn't a court officer, he was just sort of a, uh, a helper in different things, a, ha a handyman, and uh, that was in the circuit, he worked in the circuit court, and I knew him. I saw him and he was taking these people, he had a big Ellington button on and he was taking these people in and going behind the curtain with them and then coming out smiling and I, Just this 
plain as day. Did, did all day, all day long. I mean, well, it wasn't. This was late in the afternoon. It was late in the afternoon. But I saw him do that two or three times, and I, <laughs> I checked up, found out there'd only been 60 people voting, or 70 people voting that in that box up till that point. So I said, "Well, forget it. I had got more things to do." And that night, when I was checking on the returns of that box, the uh, there was a man from Jackson, Tennessee, t uh, running. Tip Taylor, maybe. Tip. That's exactly who it was. Tip Taylor was running, and and. Uh, Clifford Allen was running. He had the labor union support, which would have been for Argyle if, if Allen had been there, plus uh, Ellington. And it came out very close. And Argyle lost. I think he ran third, but he was less than 1,000 votes from the top person. Wow. But I checked on that, on that particular box. And lo and behold, here it showed 75 votes for Argyle, two votes for Ellington and none for either of the others. And I saw that fellow the, from the clerk's office the next day in the courthouse. He came up and he said, Mr. Bob, we sure fooled him, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I... How interesting. Well, uh, is there anything else you wish I had asked and you would like to tell us? I can't really think of anything. I've just enjoyed enjoyed practicing law and was today it's become so specialized and maybe that's a better service and you get uh, more learned uh, oh, and skilled uh, uh, representation but I enjoyed uh, every facet of it that I was involved in which was pretty broad. Well my final question to you is um, how would you like to be remembered or what accomplishment has given you the most satisfaction I don't know about accomplishment, but the thing I was pleased about was over the years was knowing so many of the lawyers and getting, trying to get along with them. And uh, I think um, my reputation was always fairly solid. And, oh, and, yes. And, oh, yes. Well, it's been a wonderful occasion to interview you, Bob Warner, and thank you so much for your time today. And we will be able to leave this with the Nashville Bar Association and maybe other organizations as well. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you.